Welcome guys, gals, and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary, and feminist perspective. My name is Joel, and one of your hosts, and with me as always, is your other transported host... Dara, hi, how are you? <laughs> so we have recast the role of the co-host uh, with someone who is, hopefully, frankly, like, less of a pain in the neck. Much more masculine, too. The- I saw a TikTok the other day which suggested that when you hear guy- when you see guys' Adam's apples move a lot when they are speaking, it is because it indicates that they are constantly trying to alter their voice. Um, anyway. Hi, no, it's Brian. Oh my God, what a surprise. I, um, I was shocked. Uh, Dara, I think, was the name you gave for this fictitious... Oh God, I, I'm so sorry. Room. I'm so sorry to our actual friend Dara, whose identity I stole there. Well, friend. Um, but yeah, we're here. We we are transported. We remember how you should do podcasting, as people often do after a two-week break. Joel, there was a moment in the middle of it where I was like, will this just never happen again? <laughs> because, uh, yeah, so back, quick backstory is that we were in the process of moving house um from an apartment to a house proper um and basically just all the rigmarole around that took up a huge amount of time the last couple of weeks we're now in the house uh, a week today where we had the keys a week today mm-hmm. um so we have now all of our stuff moved we have to go back and clean the fucking apartment this weekend which i'm not looking forward to but um the move is done we have accrued so much fucking shit it's unbelievable we filled like we have we filled so many boxes i i what was like 15 16 boxes yeah. but books alone i don't know if this is something that the average listener of a buffy podcast might be able to relate to but we've quite a lot of books <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's done now that like i mean we've, what's miraculous is that we kind of did a big move on saturday and we're pretty much unpacked i would say like barring a couple of weird boxes and like essentially the stuff that we haven't unpacked is stuff that we don't have homes for yet. But like additionally... Booker, he's still in a box somewhere. <laughs> yeah, just scratching, he's trying to scratch his way out. Um, we'll find a dead cat and scratch marks and just cry and cry and cry. Grim, grim, very um, grim. So the other thing is that the audio quality will be a bit echoey because as happens with houses that are empty, there's quite a bit of echo. We literally like set up a, like a, what, what was this even called? Table? A party table kind yeah. of thing. And uh, like all the equipment like half an hour ago. Yep. Um, but yeah, so I, have a, I actually have a plan for the apartment because obviously as they said, it's terrible to clean and everyone hates cleaning. So I say, we say to the, the management company, we plan on cleaning this place, but sure the, you know, the mayor turned into a big dino snake and we had to blow it up with some TNT. And Nothing that's kind do. of, you know, that's, that's how I was raised. Yeah. Nothing I could do, dude. Okay, uh, let's give your Buffy on summary. Um, so this episode is Hell's Bells. It is was first aired on March 5th, 2002. Um, it was directed by David Solomon, who last directed Wrecked, and it was written by Rebecca Rand Kirshner, who last wrote Tabula Rasa. And here is your Buffy on summary. At his wedding, Xander is visited by what claims to be his future self, and shown how he becomes a bitter abusive drunk like his father. Uh... Oh, wait, let me just... Tr- At his wedding, Xander is visited by what claims to be his future self and shown how he becomes abusive like drunk. A bitter abusive drunk like his father. Is visited by and shown. That's a very awkward split. Anyway. Uh, the man, a demonized victim of Anya's curses, is lying. Buffy defeats him. Nonetheless, Xander is persuaded by his family's behavior that he is doomed to become like them and leaves. De Hoffren recruits, re-recruits Anya as a vengeance demon. That's better. Yeah. We love a show where demonize is not a, like a euphemism. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have because it's being uh, being a little stretch, and thank you everyone for for, for sticking with us and, and being so so uh, re- normal and understanding. Um, that sounds like a euphemism, but like that's what people were normal. No, actually, that, it was actually something we, we we talked about. It's like it's really nice, kind of like having fans and people who listen and all that kind of stuff who are just like chill. <laughs> yeah, it's a real it's a real it's, it's a real valuable resource. And um, but in this in in this. Um, stressful and, and, and disruptive move period we have obviously watched a lot of tv as well and a lot of kind of content yeah. and, and stuff. i was like oh do i feel bad about that because we were watching tv but we didn't get buffy boys done but then i was like no way that's we're not fucking freaks we're allowed to have time at the end of the day to unwind after moving dozens of boxes to watch a bit of tv i would say watching tv 
was almost medically necessary because there was times over the last two weeks where I very much felt like um, that Rugrats gif where it's like, Stu, why are you making chocolate pudding at 2am? It's because I've lost control of my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic one. Um, but we've watched a lot of stuff. Yep. Um, so let's jump right into it. I think the first thing we wanted to talk about was... So Whistle Stop Tour for the Crypt First Couple of Items. We watched um, season two of Feel Good. We talked about Feel Good season one just last year. It feels like a million years mm. ago. Season two was just phenomenally good. It, uh, Mae Martin is the um, a bit of a visionary. I, I love her. Um, yeah. Slash them, slash him. Yeah, so I am um, big Mae Martin fan. I have... Uh, it was it Martin was, who once liked a Buffy Boy see, tweet. Th- this is it. This is it. I, I retweeted a Buffy Boy tweet. Did, sorry, absolutely. I fish for a like from May uh, because May, amongst uh, her many qualities, um, was a massive Buffy fan when she was growing up. As we all in terms were. of pronouns, uh, May Martin uses any pronouns, I believe. Yeah, and that implies non-binary. Yeah, and it, but uh, basically, the, her own comedy, her own life, and her show is very much about you know that she just really hasn't kind of come to like a categorical conclusion with that stuff and that mm-hmm. I think something she returns to a lot is that what she identifies gender wise more than anything is Leo DiCaprio but specifically when he's in the Nike's armor in Romeo and Juliet <laughs> oh so she identifies as my sexual awakening as a 14 year old <laughs> yeah very much so but uh, wonderful um, feel good kind of dramatizes which you mentioned you see a lot of their uh, her actual life around kind of queer relationships and relationships with people who are maybe coming out of the closet uh, and people who have addiction issues and all that kind of stuff um, and anxiety issues and anxiety trauma issues and just the trauma being in the world and all that kind of stuff and it's equal parks kind of um, doesn't give easy answers very funny but also like quite like strong and hard hitting yeah. in places um, and so you, easy recommend I recommend it to a couple people because it's like it's hard to miss here it has everything and it's British, so it has six episodes and like it's yeah, twenty minutes per episode. So watch the two, the two seasons you could watch. You know, uh, in this space of time, you'd watch two movies. No, wait, two long movies. Um, and the other person in it is, of course, uh, Charlotte Ritchie. Charlotte Ritchie, who uh, was in Fresh Me back in the day, which was a Channel Four sitcom. Um, which I really liked and she's also in what else is she in she was in Doctor Who at some she point between last year's Doctor Who Christmas special she's, she's in Taskmaster, Taskmaster which yeah. we really like I just really like her I think she's really funny and I think she's underappreciated in Feel Good because she's comedically so strong and yeah. also very emotive and I just I, I really like her okay next point is we watched um, uh, Starstruck Starstruck yeah. which is uh, basically a, a HBO Max slash BBC a sitcom starring Rose... Rose Matafeo, who is a New Zealander uh, comedian, which you might not be... Uh, based in the UK, though. Based in the UK, yeah. So we, we find a lot of content these days by watching this show we love, Taskmaster, which is primarily comedians each season. And then from that, I can't, I, I tend very much to go and find their other content. Yeah. Um, so Rose is on those recent seasons that we watched, and Starstruck is... like It sounds like a trite way to describe it, but it's essentially like a millennial rom-com, you know? It's a millennial rom-com starring two people of colour in the UK and it is sweet it's stupid it is funny it is six episodes long it's gentle <laughs> oh eight episodes Might no be, six it, it, oh, no I think it's just no, six six, six. Yeah, six yeah. and again 20 minute episodes so fucking worth a watch it was funny and touching and sweet and actually I would say doesn't ever really wade into darkness yeah, no, because he, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's like rom coms and the people who the demographics they're originally made for. They were meant to be light. That you, you know, um, our generation, our new demographics, all that kind of stuff. We have kind of an entitlement to have just something popcorny as well. And it's very much, it's yeah. very much, it's very classic. And you know, know what? It's it's so funny because I feel so coded to when I see people of color being the main characters in something. I'm like, okay, and where does the darkness come in here? Where do you get <laughs> yeah. the racial abuse? Where do you get the trauma and stuff? Yeah. It's like fuck that fucking noise i mean like absolutely that needs to be communicated as part of people's experience like or, or should be given people should be given space to communicate that they should also be given space to not fucking talk yeah. about that all the fucking time and, and it, it, it has a great premise it's basically that rose um hooks up a guy on new year's and she doesn't realize he's a famous action star and then she gets pulled into over the course of a year it's kind of this will they won't they back and forth yes him basically like being famous and her being like it's inverted it's inverted notting hill except um better <laughs> yeah and I really like Lonning Hill Look, I think to, to sum it up like one of the quintessential things when she leaves his apartment for the first time like all the paparazzi start like um, like taking photos of her and they're like oh and they're like oh you you uh, you home wrecking slut what are you doing 
and she's like and she's ho- she just sees like a couple of bags on the ground and they're like oh are you just the cleaner actually no they, she, they're like she's holding bags they're like oh it's just the cleaner and, and then later on she's like um the speed at which they determined i was the cleaner was really upset <laughs> so yeah it's recommend, wonderful recommend. Huge rec- who's your recommended um the other two slightly more meaty things that we oh we said we'd talk meaty about starstruck fuck it anyway yeah. um we have started watching a new tv show called evil um, which is uh, by Robert King and Michelle King, who are the couple, uh, I, b- I believe are married, um, but they created The Good Wife, um, and presumably also The Good Fight, actually, which has come back next week. I'm mm-hmm. so excited. Uh, but and there's so many good things coming back at the moment. Like, well, <laughs> so many good things. Rick and Morty is back. Um, uh, Drag Race All Stars 6 is this weekend. <laughs> so we, have plen- we have plenty of content going forward. Anyway, so. Um, they're, it's their new TV show, basically. It's it's evil. I think it was it first started on uh, CBS Access, which is a streaming service, and then it moved to I think something started with a P Access Power Main Power Man Plus Power Man Plus. Um, and I got onto it because the AV Club gave the second season a A minus review, and I tend to really trust the AV Club when it comes to TV. I think they have a great TV review section. Um, I disagree with them sometimes, but for the most part, I think they're quite on the on the money. Um, and so we went back and we started watching season one. It stars oh god, what's his name? The guy who's Luke my, Cage, my, my Coulter, who played Luke Cage, I'm and so he was also Lamont Bishop in The Good Wife. Yeah, and Katja Herbers, who might not be as well known, but she played the daughter of the Man in Black in Westworld, and she also had a, a, a sniffing role in The Leftovers. And we were wondering whether she was the doctor who designs the shape she is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it is about a psychologist who teams up with a priest to investigate whether or not uh, the Catholic Church needs to do exorcisms in certain situations. And it's a as fun as that sounds. Yeah, it is. It's very a horror TV show. Yeah, it's, it. But so far, there's a ton of character work happening, incredibly strong performances through it, and just it's a light touch, but with the right amount of silly darkness, and it's yeah. kind of camp. It's de- there's definitely some camp elements to it. Um, the whole premise being that, you know, the, the the guy, Mike, is like he investigates all this backlog of potential exorcisms. He's a priest in training, but he used to be a journalist or something along those lines. And the question is always with every episode, is it actually potentially supernatural or is it there a reasonable explanation? But it has the pacing of a horror film. Like, it is, yeah. like uh, even in the first couple of episodes, there was a couple of scenes where, like, that's quite, like, for lack of a better term, like, graphic and shocking, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? And um, the final thing we're going to mention very briefly is season two of Mythic Quest, which we talked about a lot last year. Season two is ongoing, and two of the recent episodes, the two middle episodes about the uh, writer, um, uh, F. Murray Abrahams' character in the 70s, and the second episode of that two part arc where he talks to some old friends. Um, give reason again. If you haven't tried it, or if you tried it and you thought it was only okay, Mythic Quest is. 1000% worth a watch. It is funny, touching, weird, stupid, and when it takes itself seriously, it is immaculate, I would say. Yeah, and I, I think it's the episodes like that which really stand out because it shows that, you know, the other episodes dabble with a kind of writing, but it has this force behind it that it's kind of sampling from. Um, but it's, I think it's actually quite a. Um, quite a relevant show because it, t- it talks in like a lot of accurate detail uh, about the fact that, you know, how in say game industries which is very modern very millennial type of industry how women have to act or do act how yeah. men have to act and do act what the, how, how the power dynamics are different in a way that isn't reflected in, in, in older uh, industries you know so it's, 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 it's pertinent it's just very funny as well yeah um so um speaking of things that are very funny so um this episode of buffy <laughs> did you like it joe um, so I so I said to Brian, so I kind of really kind of like um, jacked into this episode because I don't know it very well. I think it was around the time where my watching a Buffy on my original run got a bit patchy, and I kind of I've seen things out of order from season six and seven. Um, I I did not like it as an episode nope. of Buffy uh, at all. Um, I thought that it was it really really waded into a genre that it is not it is just not equipped for. It was really atypical. I thought because I love broken things, I thought it was fascinating to watch because of that. Um, but I don't think there's any other episode of Buffy like it. It's this massive family dynamic thing. This, you know, you have Buffy juggling at one point and trying to entertain. It's like an episode of like Happy Endings or a sitcom or something. It's like ten percent more serious than that. 
um and then like really like weird tonal shifts where it's like and then he hit her with a frying pan you know and now we're back to maybe buffy doing some gags it's, it's, it was bizarre it's yeah. bizarre experience and obviously this is the episode which we have to talk about because this is kind of the linchpin of the xander on you thing like when we're watching their relationship we know it's building to the wedding and then what happens afterwards is the aftermath of the wedding so this is kind of really meant to hold that whole story this is together it, this yeah. is it yeah yeah and um it's uh, yeah i i I would say it is definitely nothing like the awfulness of your wrecked and gone and those episodes from earlier in the season um as in i I don't think it's it's not hokey in those ways i think it's just a failed attempt at a thing in you know and a thing that i can i can stomach but yeah no it's not this kind of episode of buffy is just not for me for whatever reason yeah so let's kind of like get into it break it down a little bit so what are the things that make it unusual one is there's no um really extant threat in this episode and no. there so we have this um this guy who's whose name i had a second ago in my house but basically the guy who pretends to be future xander and is actually a Stuart burns so he was a someone who on your vengeance in 1914 for being a womanizer it seems that, like sent him to a hell dimension but also turned him into a much more powerful demon it seems mm-hmm. uh, and he's come back to ruin when her Paris, life she does, she does that she turned Olaf into a troll and stuff true like that. yeah but I, I don't know if it's like a great business model for what she does no it, um, it's come back to bite her in the ass twice now and there have been other episodes of Buffy where there's minimal threat or a singular threat that only comes out of the episode but it, it's always a threat which affects kind of indiscriminately um it's always something that has trapped everyone in the house, even if you only see it at the end. This really only affects Xander. And, like, yes, Buffy fights him for a bit at the end, but, like, no one else really notices for, like, a long, long time in the episode. I think part of it as well is that the, the actual threat there doesn't properly tie back into the communi- what's trying to be communicated here. Because the threat here is the, the guy showing Xander this stuff and that, like, you know, causes Zon- uh, Anya pain that makes sense plot wise it doesn't really do great metaphorical work because Anya in this situation she feels saddened that she has done this she she, I think she recognises that there's something imbalanced about the fact that this is ha- like she she recognises that she's maybe done some wrong here and it's a funny one because it's not part of her character arc ever that you know maybe Anya was wrong to have done vengeance mm-hmm. and like obviously in season seven when you get to selfless you kind of have to deal with that a little bit but to this point it hasn't really been broached so communicating it as potentially like a punishment for Anya like this episode as Anya punishment because that's kind of what yeah. happens ultimately is it doesn't work for the arc of the relationship for the season for the for the show really um it's much more about Xander and Xander getting shown potentialities of what might happen and running from them um yeah no you're you're, you're home saying right and what i think is really interesting about this is that buffy you know buffy has this uh, a lot which a lot of programs don't have which they often have to redeem terrible people yeah um and what made me think of it was i heard on a, a different uh, shows people talking about the tv show loki which we actually haven't talked about oh yeah loki fuck's sake but which is just, great so far. Yeah, but just very briefly to address that. So Loki from the MCU, objectively a villain, kill, has killed many people, yep. but was also in the Avengers very much like giving a scene where he was analogized to the Nazis. Remember how like a, yep. a, like a concentration camp survivor stood up to him or whatever? And no matter how anti-hero his character may be in Loki the TV show, we're meant to like and root for him. Yep. And it's something which genre TV shows really want you to be able to do is kind of like like people who have done like objectively maybe really heinous unforgivable things and in Buffy the linchpin for that is always have you seen it happen on screen because Angel is forgiving about for pretty much everything he did as Angelus until we see him do it yeah um, Spike is a longer road to, to hoe because we see him do a lot of villainy on screen Anya we don't actually see her do anything except kind of inconvenience Cordelia and no one really remembers that yeah. but she has done a lot of really vicious graphic things so it's, it's all about whether you've seen it and because on, you know, Anya has done probably potentially worse things than Spike, for example, on certain scales or certain vindictiveness. Um, but she's always gotten a pass on the show up until now. So yeah, it's a weird thing can now be like, you know, now she's in some way getting getting punished for it. Yeah, yeah it's it's a confused message ultimately, which is fine. Um, but it just it means that this episode kind of sits a bit wrong. I would probably suggest that this episode is Xander at his worst. Oh, one of his worst moments 
Um, like, the episode continuously tries to communicate that Xander is kind of, like, understandable in what he's doing because he's shown all these examples from his potential future and his present family mm-hmm. that he could turn, he could follow the path of his parents and turn into an abusive drunk, essentially. Um, and, like, I mean, one of the things Mark Field says, notes is, like, you know, yeah, but when you're an adult, when you see that, you, the, the thing to do to change that is to prevent it, not to remove yourself, you know? And then also it's a situation where he... I don't know. He he he's looking for an out. Mark also notes his conversation a year ago with Anya, where but when uh, uh, Riley left Buffy, mm-hmm. where Anya says, "If you're ever thinking of leaving me, you'll let me know well in advance, right?" And he says, "Yep, yeah, I'll give you big red warning signs. I promise." Yeah. So it's, uh, and just this stuff where like you know very like the last episode where they're talking about oh the wedding's not important the marriage is yeah where he said that to her. All this stuff, it's like, you know, I'm not trying to suggest that, like, you know, oh, a character has to be consistent across what they say. But I think that, like, you know, the character of Xander becomes a bit irredeemable in terms of his approach to stuff. I mean, at the very least, it's almost impossible to like Xander after this episode. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I think, what lets it down for me is that not that people should have to, not the characters have to have trauma to be interesting but it was always like a very grounding thing about Xander it's like there's this implication that there is a reason uh, why he is the way he is or like there's something or a contributory factor from his family and he was he is always being aware of that he is being painfully aware of his family yep. so this episode tries to present it that because we now see it or because it's like a big event and it's, it's unavoidable that um, he is somehow kind of making a new revelation about this a new mm-hmm. realization but what's missing from that is a couple of things one is he has never been kind of repressed about the way his family is he's always been upfront about it yeah. and everyone at the like they actually have a number of jokes at the wedding that everyone's like oh my all my family are kind of difficult drunk so keep them away from the bar it's not even like he's embarrassing from his friends or it works his difficult family life clashing with his new life or anything like that so he already knew this mm-hmm. and not to be too petty about it, but also the future that he's shown with Anya is strong in such broad strokes. Like his like two teenage it's like, ah, get me a beer, you terrible woman. And it's like his two teenage children, one of whom has like elf ears. And it's like, I hate you, dad. I wish There's you were also dead. a little bit of like, you know, where you, the, the child being part demon is kind of communicated as being like, oh, fuck, wouldn't that be awful? Yeah, as Which if like, he hasn't considered basically that this could happen, etc. Yeah. yeah, it's just bizarre throughout. Um, I but, also bring in this with a weird element where I've said this before about Angie, where the, to try and create these parallels between, I suppose, mixed marriages, for lack of a better term. Okay. You know, because they they try to create this thing where it's like, okay, well, there's like the human side and the demon side. Yeah, you know? for sure. But what doesn't work with Anya is that she is not part of, and wasn't part of a kind of hetero, heterogeneous kind of like group of demons. Yeah. So, and she doesn't have any demon blood at the moment. You know, she's human. So like, there's this real sense of trying to portray, you know, her her her, her side of the family as circus freaks and this yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But they're just a. They're, he's, uh, Sanders' dad used the word, or his dad, I think, used yeah. the word geeks at one point in yeah. the traditional circus uh, act um for sense of the yeah words. context yeah but they're if anything they're her co-workers yeah her former co-workers yeah um and i think um, i think parents jill i think her actual family might be well dead by this point this is true this is true um and would have been potentially very like scandinavian yeah you know? yeah um but i think what also kind of weakens the impact of what they're trying very hard to do here i think is I think the the actors who play Xander's parents do there. I I recognize both of them as character actors. They do a pretty bang up job with the material that they have, but it it really weakens the impact to actually see it in yeah, some ways. Because I totally agree. Seeing them on screen, seeing them on screen is lesser than every single time that they've been suggested. Yeah. Um. Do you know who they are as actors? I really reckon no, not offhand. I really recognize the dad. Yeah, the dad is called Casey Sanders, and he played. Um, Jimmy Waddick from Tucker, the dad, or the, uh, well, not yes. the dad, the uncle, the, the uncle, uncle who the does captain. the the guy who does the uh, dance dance revolution oh, he does. for him, you yeah, know, yeah. off screen and beats the Eye of the Tiger. I remember that. Yeah, right yeah. There, and yeah. He, he's a, he's a military guy. He and what's interesting about that, of course, is who else is in Tucker, the TV show? This is a this is a Nickelodeon, I think, sitcom or no, sorry, CBS. 
Anyway, it was this will Nicol- really divide the age demographics on, of our listenership because there's a very small window in which people will remember oh, yeah. Tucker. Yeah. So it's a sitcom, or it's a, like a, a teen sitcom from um, 2000, 2001. It had 13 episodes, but it was shown on Nickelodeon in the UK and Ireland a lot. So I would have known it quite well. Um, and uh, amongst the main characters are this guy. Um, I think the mom was somebody interesting. Yeah, she was... Um, was she Leela? She was Leela. She was the voice of Leela from yeah. Futurama, yeah. And um, Alison Lohman is in it, uh, who was in Drag Me to Hell, who hasn't actually been in it much since. She's also in Big Fish. Um, Alison Lohman has left acting, I think. Yeah, no, yeah, she, she yeah. has for the most part. I think she's doing has, she's having a return at the moment, though. Um, Drag Me to Hell, there's a movie that is a solid recommendation whenever you're wanting to watch a horror movie. Anyway, but most interestingly, Joel, who else is in uh, Tucker? Um... Seth Green. As Seth Green. As Seth Green. As actor Seth Green. Before yeah. this. So this actor will have known Seth Green playing Seth Green in Tucker. And now you've gone on to the Seth Green TV show. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so funny. Um, and then Jessica Harris, who is her, his mother, is Lee Carlington, who's a very, very um, prolific character actor. I know her best, though, for, as Fiona Kleinschmidt. Can you tell me? Can you, do you have any it sounds like a six feet under name. It is a six feet under name. It is the um, friend of Sarah, the aunt, uh, Patricia, Patricia Clarkson. Yeah. Her friend who took Nate's virginity when he was like 13 or 14 <laughs> okay, yeah. and who dies in season five and he's like like mourning her and stuff. Um, remember she falls off to Penga Canyon when uh, she's walking through with um, with uh, Patricia Clarkson. Yeah, I, yeah. That show's given us a very uh, reverent uh, uh, relationship with death, I think, because whenever we talk about this kind of stuff, it just seems funny. <laughs> It's supposed to be. It's a tragic comedy. Yeah. Anyway, so there you go. Uh, yeah, no, I thought it was it was lesser to show them, you know? Yeah, because it, it just... Um, it makes it cartoonish. And, and because, be, uh, it's not that these these characters are, these situations are, but because it's not a really hard-hitting show in that yeah. way and it's not realistic, you either go to, like, special episode about it or you do what they've done here, which is kind of paint it quite broadly with the funny uncle and the you know, broadly kind of things that sound like racial slurs, but they're about demons, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, yeah, it just, it, it makes it seem like everyone's a pain in the ass, but it's just, and also because like, it's all out of their territory, like they're at a wedding venue, it's during the day, there's like, like 25 or 30 kind of like, not named extras, but su- supporting extras there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, you can see the corners of the, of the set, I feel. And also like, none of, none there's of the- There's also some weird production issues where like, you know, at various points when you can see Anya getting the news from Dawn that Xander's run away, it's like the whole thing about the episode is that it's raining throughout and it's supposed to be like yeah. pretentious slash pathetic fallacy. Um, pathetic fallacy who for people who maybe I know for the Irish leading search it was constantly drilled into you what pathetic fallacy is <laughs> because you do a lot of Shakespeare um, so maybe maybe other education systems don't bang on about it so much but pathetic fallacy is where the weather reflects the mood of the either the text or characters within the th- text so if everything is happy things are sunny when everything is cloudy and rainy people are sad that kind of stuff something which that, that makes me think of and I think we've talked frequently about on the podcast and I think it's a TikTok we both saw I think you might have shown it to me, but the American um, being like, you know, Irish people know exactly what they did for the, their leaving oh, search, yeah. exactly what points they got. She's an American who lives in, in Dublin and she, there are two Americans who I, who I love on TikTok. One who lives in Cork, one who lives in Dublin. The one who lives in Cork, she's amazing. She just constantly does um, like translations of Irish stuff and she's like, she has an Irish boyfriend and she's just like, I keep running into these phrases that make no fucking sense like out of sight of her high no English context. But she's really respectful about it, but she's also like, this is hilarious. Like, yeah. this is not how we speak English in America, which is appropriate. And the American who lives in Dublin, she's also great. She, um, she like, she was, yeah, no, she, she has some good talks about the kind of the stuff around South William Street, which we're not going to get into here. But, <laughs> yes. um, yeah, and she was saying, oh, um, Americans, when they're asked, how do you do in your SATs? They're like, I don't know. 400 and then when you ask, ask Irish people about how they did in the leaving cert it's like well I got 675 points but I missed two points in this paper when I didn't write the thing and blah 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 and people and remember Ireland. the topics that came up in their orals and stuff yeah. and it's you know why it is Joel it's because we're fucking traumatized because the <laughs> leaving cert is the most traumatic experience you can 
you can undergo in, a, in an academic setting. It is fucking awful. I like, like, it's like widely understood to be like far too much the pressure on a single set of exams. Yeah, and it's the most grueling thing. set of exams that teenagers can go through. Yeah, so it just always makes you think of when we kind of talk about that kind of, kind of stuff. But um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's not raining at various points when you see them out behind. Um, there, there's a point where, where uh, Don, Buffy, and Willow just transport away from... Anya? Yeah, it's like there's a transitional shot missing or something. Yeah, or just in a different part of the room suddenly. Where they are not doing the, the, the thing. But in another way, the production is quite impressive because like the the extensive prosthetics done through mm-hmm. it are really good. They're all distinct. Yeah, and um, notable because the episode actually ha- was nominated for three Emmys. One of which was for hairstyling. Mm-hmm. One of which was for makeup. Mm. Non prosthetic, and one was for makeup prosthetic. Yeah, which and is like, the most nominations that any episode of Buffy got. Which is actually fair enough because as much as we, we're ragging on the story, like a lot of the yeah, a lot of the production stuff is really strong. I can see I can see a lot of focus went into like let's build this family of demons and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge undertaking to say oh we're going to put forty extras in extensive prosthetic makeup. Some of which you need to be able to speak or fight, and some of which don't, etc. Yeah, yeah, and but, Anya looked stunningly yeah, beautiful she wonderful although i do think she gets done dirty a little bit in the future visions because she progressively has older and older makeup where xander stays 21 or whatever age she is I 22 think. 22 i don't yeah. know yeah um but yeah the whole thing has a vibe of i think i said i used to haven't seen this but i said this year it's like halloween town yeah or a hocus pocus or like a disney original seasonal movie is like what it really I dis- feels like. I, I wouldn't disagree with that yeah, yeah. um uh, so uh, sorry i go ahead <laughs> I was going to say is, and um, it's also notable because the rest of the cast either don't really appear much in this episode or kind of don't really speak with their own voices, I think. Like Buffy, as you're saying, doing juggling and stuff, which is funny because that's obviously because Sarah Michelle Gellar can juggle and they yeah. brought that in. That's very cute. But it kind of felt like a celebrate. It, it felt like a, a cast party or like a skit that the cast would yeah. do, like an SNL thing, where it's like yeah. we brought on most of the most of the cast. It was like remember there was that one weird SNL skit where they brought the cast of Frasier in but put them on the bridge of of the Starship yes. Voyager. I like, had that kind of vibe to it. Yeah, yeah, it was lots of winks and nods throughout, and even just the interactions between Willow and Tara. I felt very insincere like i mean I, I love the direction that's going where they're kind of forgiving each other well tara's forgiving willow and they're kind of flirting with each other in a very natural very lovely way but at the same time it didn't feel very real you know yeah. and what i will say is that um i think on your side of it and emma caulfield is that how she reacts to it and all that and her sincerity i think she does a great job i think I totally agree. wonderful like she really I think emma caulfield is such a strong performer yeah she sells that it's actually something that's happening and that she is someone who's come to this maybe by like by like not a natural thought process but like or not a common thought process uh, but she has really invested in it and like the whole way through she's just like the whole relationship she's just coming to understand for the first time like how a relationship can be good and it's yeah. just really ready to do that and he just is not like he, yeah like her, her speech her, her like throughout she's attempting he's preoccupied by his fear throughout the episode and she is trying to find the best words to communicate that she loves him and she wants to be with him forever and like she's really struggling and like you know she's not person with words like at one point tara says to her don't use the phrase sex poodle um <laughs> in your vase yeah. yeah but like she's trying really hard to find a way to communicate to xander i love you and i want to do this with you forever so when she's walking down the aisle and the music's playing just to go up and say it's off it's really heartbreaking yeah and she says at one point to anya and or no she's anya to uh, tara and willow um, you know, it's stupid that she can't see Xander before the wedding because he's her best friend and she wants, she's excited because she tell her best friend about everything that's happening. And it's like, oh my gosh, she doesn't deserve this at all. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, should we, should, do you want to put it, do you have another note or should we go no, into I, the, no, I, the, I, I the think we, dusting? <laughs> yeah, no, I think we can wrap it up. I think uh, it's a very interesting episode for everything to now revolve around. And I think it's a, it's a vehicle. It's a vehicle for something yeah. to happen. And there, there are a lot of ideas in there, but it is not an episode in the traditional sense. It does, it just doesn't come together with a start, middle, and end. And you yeah, know. no, I agree. And what we can most say about it is that it does send Anya on a very interesting path. I like yeah. the, I like the the, the post Xander Anya yeah. stuff. Yeah, so it's an interesting catalyst, but maybe not the most entertaining episode to watch. Yeah, for sure. Joel, do you want to hear some buff bits? Please. Okay, so. Um, Apparently the phrase sex poodle is specifically written in by Kirshner because that is a phrase that Jane, uh, Jane Espenson. Espenson often used to describe herself for whatever reason. 
Um, just uh, whether people want to go to or not. <laughs> potentially. Uh, one of the interesting. Oh, one of the notes I have about Jessica. Sorry, uh, Lee Garlington, who is who plays Xander's mom, is that apparently she was originally intended to be the female lead of Seinfeld, and she was re- re- recast um, because they wanted the female lead to be from a different social sphere to the to the guys. Mm-hmm. Um, the title is a, well, like it's, it's it's a general reference just to the to the English phrase "Hell's Bells," but it's also an ACDC song, and I think ACDC are bad. Um, <laughs> and apparently, uh, Joss Whedon wrote the Buffy and Spike scene, where which actually was a really good scene. Mm-hmm. We didn't talk about it, but um, uh, Buffy basically goes to Spike and talks to him sincerely, which is very unusual. Usual, they're clearly like breaking through a communication mm-hmm. block where they're bantering. They're not even bantering. I would say. I would say they're more. Um, finding an honesty in the aftermath of a kind of period of um not looking at something but spike says like you know but if he's like oh you brought this girl with you this <laughs> ridiculous goth and um, or as uh as don puts it a manic panic freak mm-hmm. um uh, she's like oh you clearly brought her to make me jealous and he's like well did it work and she says yeah a little and that's very it like hurts, mature yeah. and uh, like moving on i think mm. and very interesting and buffy it was a good interaction but yeah just beaten wrote that apparently so now i hate it and a couple other things um as, as we know i love when the production or the wikipedia have named things that just are not needed to be named and one is that the orb that fake xander uses is named as a sphere of the future of course it is um and i think actually that image of xander having his brain scanned and sucked into the orb i think that comes up in some of the Craig sequences in future or something you're wrong actually joel it's very very similar to the um episode uh season five episode where he gets split into two character two people maybe that's it where he has his eyes flashed by the the coin remember by the where you know the where yeah yeah, that that shot is used a lot but it's very similar focus on his eyes so i can see why you're thinking that i I thought the same that 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 must be it um yeah otherwise um so uh amber ben's noted for the buffy magazine uh that in this episode she kept pulling emma caulfield's dress off because she kept stepping on it as she walked down the aisle because she's so clumsy yeah uh, and yeah she's such a clucks which is very kind of like retro where you don't hear that very much anymore. but i do believe it because she does um walk directly into a pole and wants more feeling <laughs> she, she yeah amber benson does absolutely okay and um, there's a couple of callbacks as well so one is um which i wish I, I both of which i quite liked so willow saying after sue burns is killed um does anyone else just hope it will go poof which is what she actually says in the opening um scene of the wish which is on his introduction episode uh, and also when Willow sees Xander in his tuxedo, basically alluding that good thing I realise I'm gay because otherwise we'd be in trouble here. Because obviously calling back to homecoming, which seems like a million years it ago, really does, narratively, yeah. uh, that was how they ended up uh, kind of kissing and kind of causing all that ructions with Cordelia. What was that? Okay, um, so some fashion notes for you, Joel. Uh, I think the main fashion note of the episode has to be the green, green bridesmaid dresses, which are highlighted by the characters themselves. Buffy and Dawn get off easy because they have like you know it's disgusting it's a bottle green and it is um has about eight layers of ruffles at the bottom for absolutely no reason um but theirs don't have like lobster shell arms which willows and taras do yeah they're shocking they are shocking Anya looks absolutely beautiful and i love her yeah and i love her in the blue um like gel face mask gel face mask i think that's just a classic look um I think uh, I think Xander just looks bad throughout the episode. He has way too much gel in his hair, and he just doesn't look great. Really, it doesn't look like he got a haircut for the for the for the for the wedding. No, if he did, it was like you know five dollars from his cousin Sam or whatever kind of thing. Yeah, I do have a note that says that Xander grew up to be Richard Nixon. Apparently, <laughs> um, he also has like a what's that, what's that phrase called the the the, the Atlantic or transatlantic accent that actors used in the fifties. What's that called? It's a transatlantic, mid-Atlantic, yeah. Mid- mid-Atlantic accent, yeah. Um, his his future self apparently has one for some reason. He he really speaks like an old timey Hollywood person. It's yeah. like why would he grow up to speak different? Yeah, their yeah their vision of what their family is like is like twenty years before the episode airs. It's, yeah, it's like he's he's lacking in imagination. It's kind of what's happened there. Yeah, yeah. I also want to know where Anya got that like bride platform that she's standing on for a lot of the episode like do you hire that like the little like podium that you stand rotate on? on yeah yeah it's so weird okay um 
Death Count. Do you have a Death Count for a show? Uh, well, Death of a Relationship, of Hope, of the Future for Ollie uh-huh. and Xander, and also Stuart Burns, Smash with Pillar by Xander, which I think is such a euphemism from the from the Wikipedia because yeah. it's a styrofoam pillar that he just boops him on the head with. He doesn't, like, crush him to death or anything. Also, is he, like, a human? So he is a human who was turned into a demon and sent to hell and came back from hell and pretended to be a human to... Ex- I think, he's, going into I, think he's, I think that's the equivalent of killing a human, personally. Yeah, yeah. Well, going into this, you were like, you couldn't, you couldn't quite remember if it actually was Xander or not from the future. Like, that yeah, whole couldn't. kind of motivation is really, um, really mushy. But yeah, and so is his head now that he's been yeah, crushed right. by a pillar. Okay, do you have a writing, Joe? Ooh. Um, I will probably give this... Like a five point eight human catfish whiskers. So I like I feel I'm good one. I I'm gonna give it a six point oh manic panic freaks and I I was like oh is that too harsh but I'm like I probably liked it less than you did even. Anyway, six point oh manic panic freaks and manic panic of course is the hair dye that you can get from like hot topic and like of probably Asha here mm-hmm. you know Asha <laughs> deep cut <laughs> yeah I know um yeah so i think that's probably us for that episode of buffy and uh, we have a look at the cordelia chase yes please regale us with the tales of cordelia chase joel yeah it's a really good episode over on the cordelia chase this is a uh, sleep tight um as we've talked about like this is really reminding me that like i really like season three of, of angel it's very yeah, unusual it's very unusual very engaging uh, and this is similar to hell's bells this is like a culmination episode and um, so we see a lot of threads crash together one is that you know we have this on uh, as you all remember we have this ongoing plot a uh, kind of three-way thing between or four-way really so you have Holt, who is the vampire hunter who wants to steal angel's child to punish him for killing his family in the past you have wolfram and heart as represented by lila wanting to kind of move all the pieces to their advantage angel trying to protect his son and wesley as this like really tragic figure in there where he also wants to protect angel protect connor but he's deciphered a prophecy which says that Angel will kill Connor. He doesn't know what to do. And that's kind of like a real motivator in this episode. So the uh, writers have said that Wesley essentially betrays the gang in this episode. He steals Connor. Da, 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 da. That's a dramatic interjection, is it? No, that was, um, it was supposed to be an always sunny reference. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that's Wesley betrays the gang. Same yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Okay. Um, so Wesley be- betrays the gang in this episode, which is like really, really unusual in Buffy and Angel because it, I think it might be the only time like someone does betray them where they are not evil, they're not under the influence, they're not necessarily even in the wrong. Um, the, it's just a tragic set of circumstances, yeah. and the writers have said like he didn't. She, you couldn't tell Angel because Angel wouldn't believe it because Angel's been really obsessive about this. He didn't trust um, or couldn't talk to Gung and Fred because they're in a relationship and Cordelia's on holiday. Yeah. <laughs> so he has no one to talk to. He's quite isolated just generally. Anyway. Yeah, and he seems, and he... He also, it's, it's a hard sell to say like, you know, I've read this, I've checked it a million times and from everything I can see, this is going to happen. Yeah. And like, I, it's a very sad one because like he... he isn't doing it just for Connor's sake or just for Angel's sake. It's for both of their sakes, like because yeah. he knows it would absolutely break Angel to if he he was the cause of Connor's death. Absolutely. And every moment that he sees Angel lightly interacting with Connor, it's more fuel to be like, I can't let this happen. Yeah. And this episode kind of has it all. They, you know, we have a kind of a disturbing element to it where um, the bad guys have been lacing um, Angel's pig's blood with some of Connor's blood. Yeah, because to... they stole it a couple of episodes ago. Yeah, exactly. So that, that was what we were missing, is that it was just lacing it. Um, but to give him, um, Angel starts acting manic, more bloodlust, make him more of a threat to Connor. There is a kind of monster of the week thing about a, a girl who turns up from a, a, a band who have turned into demons and her have infected her. There's actually like a fairly decent side plot. Uh, and Angel goes and rips them to pieces. Uh, and then everyone moves, everyone makes their move. Wesley goes to Holtz and um, tries to make a deal where he'll be allowed to take Connor away or whatever. Um, Lauren accidentally reads Wesley when Wesley's singing a lullaby to Connor, realizes what he's going to do, so Wesley has to knock him out. Um, Justine, who's Holtz's like second in command, kind of feels like questionable about him um, but then it seems like she's betrayed him, but actually what she does is slit, like it cuts Wesley's throat and leaves him to bleed to death. And then when everyone seems like they're going to get away and Hulk steals the baby and makes a run for it, and everyone's like, why did Wesley do this? Why did Wesley do this? Um, 
Wolfram Hart's paramilitary team stop them. It comes to this standoff. Angel's like, take Connor, please. Just, I just want him to live. Even because uh, Wolfram Hart planning on killing him or taking him. Yeah, and Hulk's is like, maybe I'll just kill him. It'll be easier. Um, so Hulk's, and this is a bit, I, I completely forgot about this arc. Hulk's plan apparently was just to take him to go to Utah and disappear into the world. Yeah. But then Sa Zhang, who is the demon who is an instigating all of this and brought Hulk's to the future, but has no physical power in the dimension, opens a hole to Korthos, which, which is a terrible hell dimension. And plans on like pulling them all through because he can't let Connor live in this dimension. Yeah, and it's just a threat, but then Hulk kind of takes the, the, the extremist uh, approach and jumps into the portal. Angel's left crying on the ground. Um, Before he does that, he said, like, the moment of him like begging Hulk to take Connor away, mm-hmm. to please just take him, is it's very upsetting. Yeah, and... Um, Wesley is left seemingly to die. Everything is falling apart. And then we have a very meta-textual moment where Sajan says, okay, everyone have a great summer because Angel, the show, went on hiatus for six weeks at this point and kind of left it on a cliffhanger. Yeah. Um, so you, and then this is kind of what the whole thing revolves around. Like, like Wesley is completely detached from the group, I think, for at least a season after this. Angel tries to kill him. Connor ends up being raised in the hell dimension. It's like quite an impactful and well-paced episode and and something which i will say now because we won't remember in future uh, is that in season five eventually sajan comes back and we find out that the reason why he did all this is the prophecy actually said that conger would kill sajan who is actually like a quite powerful creature Mm -hmm. Uh, and so he wanted conger to die to prevent this but then he eventually has created the circumstances where Connor yeah. is able to kill him yeah, yeah, yeah. in season five. So, but he disappears for a season and a half and just comes back in one episode for that conclusion. So, yeah, I, I really like this. I would give this like easily like nine fail famous gestures. I was going to say I would give it a nine fail famous gestures, and it's the closest I've been to get. Well, maybe this and I will remember you would probably the closest I would give to saying maybe a ten. Probably if I'm rating it, it'd be nine point three, nine point four. Yeah, area. it's yeah, a it was- strong, strong episode. Yeah, it has one of the one of the one of the most like genuinely morally grey episodes, which is something that the show really aspires to, and as we've said, doesn't really always get there. Yeah. But this is like it is genuine tragedy and genuine heightened kind of conflict between the characters. And also, one of the things that Angel does well that Buffy doesn't always do well is that in its in its darker episodes, having moments of like light hearted comedy, like where Buffy does like dark comedy when it's doing a dark episode. Um, Angel often has like funny, like lighthearted, like you know, just Angel like goofing around with yeah. Connor kind of thing, and uh, it's interesting. It's a weird balance, and it's very unusual. Like one of the things about Angel that I always forget is, or that I always remember <laughs> specifically about it as a show is that it has goofiness throughout. Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting kind of balancing element to it. So yeah, I enjoyed it. Great. Okay. okay. Another take for this being an episode of Angel that was better than the Buffy episode this week. For sure. Though next week we have um, Normal Again, which is the episode of Buffy, I'd say, that we refer to the most that we refuse to learn the name of. <laughs> um, but I actually really like Normal Again, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to talking about it next week. I think it might be one of the hidden gems of season six. Anyway. Okay. Wrap us up there, Joe. Absolutely. So, uh, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, thank you very much for joining us this week, for rejoining us. Maybe this is your first episode, and this was terribly confusing, but we hope yeah. you'll stick around. Um, I saw something very distressing, which was Ian um, Crawford, who Carlos Crawford, who uh, runs um, Sirefest, Sirefest, which is basically our sister podcast, and we're basically best friends. Yeah. Um, he posted today, which showing his like ten most uh, listened to episodes of his podcast, and one of them is the first episode. The rest of them are all like in the last like a year and it's because a lot of them are interviews with cast members and stuff but some of them aren't and it's like how do you end up in a situation where like i mean i don't personally i don't drop into podcasts at the most recent episode ever i always go back to the start with podcasts yeah i think people are different but people don't though yeah yeah but yeah people i think i think podcast listening habits are one of these things that everyone assumes that everyone is broadly similar and yeah. if you actually say how you do it be like everyone else is a freak compared to me you know, yeah that's how yeah. you would feel about it probably because i definitely every single time i listen to a podcast i'm like go back to the start yeah um so on that note folks um thanks so much for joining us if you enjoyed this episode if you missed us let us know uh tell your friends uh tell your uh demon relatives <laughs> and we will see you next time buffy boys i'm buffy boys buffy see boys. ya echo Kaka. Slump. <laughs> <laughs>